Hey girl, Marissa here. You are listening to the Codepend Dummy Podcast. As a young woman, you have been raised, reinforced, and rewarded for putting the needs of others above your own. Now, in your 20s, you're finding yourself exhausted, exasperated, and enveloped in shit relationships, especially the one you have with yourself. Codependency is a way of being where we put the feelings, wants, and needs of others above our own in an unconscious attempt to meet our own feelings, wants, and needs. Sorry to break it to you, sis, but that is not sustainable. This podcast is to help you undo all that so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Coda Pandemi podcast. Today, I'm with Nora Bermudez. Nora is a mindfulness-based therapist who helps women in intercultural relationships experiencing rejection and or disownment by their parents to live authentically and confidently with the choices they have made about dating. Nora has experience working with Middle Eastern women with immigrant parents, and she's been practicing therapy for 10 years with a private practice in California. Nora, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Marissa. I'm happy to be here. Yes. All right. So first, we'll start with the typical two, Nora. So how do you define or conceptualize codependency? That's a good question. So how I would conceptualize it is when someone has to sacrifice their authenticity in order to have a connection with someone or to maintain a connection with someone. So basically what I mean by that is people start to kind of disown in a way parts of themselves, right? Give up parts of themselves, put their wants and needs on the back burner for the sake of something that they're wanting out of that relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And that can be so many things. It could be being liked, it could be love, acceptance, support, whatever it is, they're getting something out of it, right? Right. And so they've learned to give up parts of themselves in order to continue to receive that. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you sense this is conscious or unconscious or both? (laughs) I feel like a lot of times it's unconscious. I think there are times where it could, I mean, it could be both. I think that there are times where people have said, okay, well, this person doesn't like this about me, so I'm going to stop being this way, right? Or I'm not going to show this part of myself because I get this type of reaction from this person or these people, right? So they are conscious of it. Um, A lot of the times it it can stem from childhood, right? And it's it's very unconscious and, and we become, you know, what people call it like people pleasing, Right. And, you know, the yes person where we just want to please other people and we put our needs aside. So I think it can be a combination of both. I've seen more times than not that people are not very conscious of it or don't really understand why am I doing this? They don't understand what why they're doing it and that they're actually getting some type of benefit that's reinforcing them to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. It seems like it's self-sabotage or neglecting or, yeah, some type of like self mm, hate or rejection. But yeah, there there is some benefit. There is some mm, perk. But yeah, usually we're just not aware of A, why we're doing it or B, what the perk is. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or how to to even stop it or change it. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. And typical uh, number two, do you have a codependent experience or relationship from your own life that you can share with us? 
Yes. Um, so just to give a little bit of background history, I, um, my mother's from Argentina. She grew up Catholic. My dad's from Syria and he grew up Muslim. So I was raised in a Muslim household where it was pretty strict, you know, um, my dad was pretty strict, um, very religious. So me, I, me and my siblings, we were all expected to believe certain things, act a certain way, uh, dress a certain way, speak a certain way, right? And if I deviated from that, um, there was a lot of shame that came with that because of the reaction that I would get from my father. And so even as a child, I started to, wasn't conscious of it, right? But I started to change parts of myself, just own parts of myself, right? Mm -hmm. Where I was wanting that acceptance because if I knew, okay, if I said this or if I did that, maybe my dad would get mad or lecture me or I feel bad about myself or, you know, he may not love me, right? And so... I noticed that I, in adulthood, I was doing the same exact thing as I was doing in childhood, right? Where, and in particular with my relationship, when I started dating my husband, it'll be about 11 years now, 11 years ago, I did not disclose that to my dad. And I kind of lived like a double life mm -hmm. where it, this whole part of me and my relationship was like a secret. And, and it wasn't just because, oh, this is just for us. And I just want to keep it between us. It was like, I am so scared of what may happen if he found out, right? He, my husband, he is not Muslim. He's not Middle Eastern. Um, and so I, I, I kept it a secret and in a way, just like lied about my relationship status, you know? And so I think that that was codependency right there, right? Because I was hiding a part of myself, right? A person that I loved and I was dating and I, you know, was wanting to spend my life with, kept that from him. And even with other things, not just in relationships, there, the way that I, how, what I wore to go to my dad's house, right? It was very dependent on, okay, is this gonna trigger him? Is this gonna cause a fight? Right. Um, my beliefs oftentimes um I would stay quiet about it or just kind of nod, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of really just speaking my truth, you know, and I think it's okay for people to do that, right? I'm not saying that we need to argue about everything or debate about things, but I think where it came from for me it wasn't just like, oh, I don't care and I don't want to engage in that. It was I'm so scared to engage in that. I'm so scared to show that part of myself because I may be rejected. Right. And so for so long I kept that until, you know, it did start to change when, you know, me and my husband started to get more serious, right? And we wanted to move in together and then get married. Right. And so um and, you know, I can understand my dad's perspective, right? He, his upbringing is so different. You know, he grew up in Syria. They don't, you know, Muslims in Syria, they, they, their life is completely different, right? And the, the dating is, from what I've learned is not, it's not like how it is here. They don't date, you know, they meet somebody and then they plan to be engaged and, you know, possibly get married, right? And so, I can understand how that was hard for my dad to accept. But once I started to move past that fear and say, okay, I'm going to tell him. And if he's not going to be okay with it, um, then that's okay. Right. Like that, it's going to hurt. It's going to suck. Right. It's going to take me time to get over that. But that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with me. And it doesn't mean that he doesn't love me because I know that he does. It's just that that's that's how he sees things. And that's how those, those are his beliefs. And so I did slowly start to open up. Like I said, I started to open up, hey, I'm dating this person and we're moving in. And then eventually was like, I'm getting married, right? And, uh, you know, he spoke up a lot about things. We had conversations, but I like that we had conversations, even though sometimes those conversations were really hard. 
I like that there was dialogue instead of like, I'm so scared, I'm just not even going to say anything. I'm so scared, I'm just going to keep it to myself. And I'm not going to honor my own needs of like, hey, I'm in a relationship and I can share it and I can celebrate it, right? And so I've learned that there's still a lot of things that my dad doesn't accept and a lot of things that he bites his tongue on because we've had conversations on it. But there are a lot of things that my dad has changed with these conversations. And he's had more understanding of my perspective. It may not be 100% perfect between us, but I think that working through that codependency and saying, okay, this is what I want for my life. And I'm going to talk to my dad about it. And he can be a part of that or he doesn't have to be a part of it. And I'm not going to hate him. And I'm not going to force him to see it my perspective. We're going to have a conversation about it and see where we are. Mm. So that was my experience. Wow. This is me putting my therapist hat on. (laughs) So I'm curious, like, what what are your thoughts, Nora, on like personally in your life and also just like other codependents? So here you are, right? Codependent with your father mm-hmm. who married a non-Middle Eastern Catholic, mm-hmm. right? But you're scared to reveal to him, I'm marrying a non-Middle Eastern non-Muslim. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you make of the fact that sometimes, yeah, like, I feel like I have been codependent with very flawed people, but mm-hmm. I'm trying my utmost to be per- the perfect, um, the perfect daughter, the perfect friend, the perfect mm-hmm. whatever, even though like their, their flaws are are known, but here I am really trying to comply with their ideal. What are your, yeah, Yeah. what do you make of that? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that, I I am aware of that. And I've even brought that up to my dad. I'm like, excuse me, you married, like don't even, right? And so I am very aware of that. And even from a very young age, because my mom, we knew right off the bat, like my mom is not like, she's not doing what my dad does, you know, like from a very young age, you, you pick that up. Right. And so, um, I think what was communicated to me, um, but it still didn't make sense was, well, men can marry outside. Mm. Women cannot because the religion is passed on from the man. Right. And so, whether that's true or not, you know, to each their own. To, but for me, I still was like, huh? I'm like, but that's not fair. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, you know? And so, um, yeah, I think a lot of it was like, well, he's doing it. It's interesting that I'm doing it too, right? Or I did it too. Um, so then he must not think it's that bad, right? Who knows, you know? And so, um I knew deep down inside that it never, like for me, it didn't feel wrong to date outside of my culture. And it may have been because I was brought up with intercultural uh, parents Mm -hmm. that were, you know, together and raised me, right? And so I saw both sides. And even for me now, I'm like, well, this is great. Like more cultures, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered your question. Did it answer it? Partly. So personally, I'm hearing how you were able to, or like, yeah, like it, your perspective and like looking at the reality of it. Yeah. You were like, you, you were the same. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. What do you think too, like more broadly just about, yeah, we could say like young codependent women who potentially, yeah, are codependent with a parent or a partner or a friend who has like these ideals, even though they're not living up to them. And yet we're doing our utmost to, to meet the expectation. Uh, Yeah. Your thoughts on that. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, I think a lot of times, at least for me, the message that was given to me was like that my parents had made a lot of mistakes. 
right? And that they wanted me to be better, have a mm -hmm. better life. And I think that there may be this expectation on ch on children, adult children, right? Of like, even from a young age of like, I need to be better, right? Even though my parent is flawed, they messed up, there's a million things I wouldn't do, you know, that they did. I need to be better. So we set this kind of expectation on ourselves, right? Of I need to be better. I need to do better. I need to do different, you know? And, um, you know, I think deep down inside, it's all just for that, um, that acceptance from our parents, you know, and that, that feeling of like, I'm loved and I'm good enough. And um, even though our parents made the same or worse decisions, we have this expectation. I think there's that difference between the parent and the child of like every generation is expected to be better in some way, right? right? And so then we become codependent of like, mm -hmm. okay, I need you to accept me. I'm different, but I'm hopefully better. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, total sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. So interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, Focusing on your specialties, I'm curious, we'll start with what does codependency look like in women with their families when they start to attempt dating outside their culture? So a lot of this may sound like things I've already talked about in my own experience, but what, not just from my own experience, but with people that I've worked with, I think the biggest thing I see when it comes to like what a codependent relationship could look like in women that are trying to date or are dating outside the culture, I think a lot of them have told me is they feel like they're living like a secret life, a double life, right? So I think, I don't know if lying is the right word, but just like hiding. I think that's a huge thing that women experience is like, just like hiding, like the secrecy right um of what's going on with them who are they dating who they're attracted to um so i think a lot of it is that just like not even talking about it not even acknowledging it right, right? um there can be the other end of the spectrum where they do communicate to their parents that they are dating and the parents are maybe not accepting of it and they so desperately want them to be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And they are not okay until their parents are okay. Right. right. We all want our parents to be accepting, right. We all, that's just normal. Right. But with the codependency part, it's that they're just not okay. They're not okay until their parents are okay with it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they do everything they can to try to convince them to try to see their side. Um, and it causes a lot of strain between them, right? Because one, the parents have one idea and the adult child has a different idea or a different perspective, right? Rather than them understanding each other's perspective, right? There's mm -hmm. kind of this push and pull in a way. Um, so I think a lot of that, it, you know, a lot of women um, feel like, destroyed in a way, right? Because they can't get their parents to see their perspective or to see that they are in a loving relationship or happy in a relationship. So um, there's this constant back and forth of like convincing, um, maybe even some negotiating, negotiating, right? Of like, well, if I do this, then will you meet him? Or if, you know, trying to kind of get them to come. And in a way, they're, they're, and I think, you know, negotiating is not a bad thing, but I think if it's really sacrificing something that is important to you, then it becomes unhealthy, mm -hmm. right? And so being able to distinguish that and say, what am I willing to give up or bend on? And I'll be, I'll still be okay. My relationship will be okay versus, man, I'm giving this huge part up of myself or my relationship just so my parents can meet you or so, just so they could show up to the wedding or, or be okay with you. You know, I think that there is a lot of that that happens in codependency. Can you give an example of, yeah, like an unhealthy attempt at negotiating or, yeah, what could one give up in hopes mm -hmm. to get, like them to meet meet the, the person? To meet the person? Yeah. Um, 
I think a lot of what I've seen is the parents will agree to meet the person if the significant other converts to the religion mm. that the family practices. So, you know, I work with Middle Eastern women, but I have a lot of experience with Muslim people too, right? And so, okay, I'll meet him if, you know, he says he's Muslim and he starts practicing, or if we have a wedding and the wedding is on our terms, right? And we take control and we have the wedding that we want and how we want it. And, um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's very scary to think about losing your parents, that it's understandable for people to say, okay, like, we'll just do it. even if they're not really going to do it, and they just say it, right? Like, okay, I'll just do it just to please them. Let's just like, you know, um, I see a big part of that, right, of like, having to make huge shifts in their lives like that, mm -hmm. to receive that acceptance. Yeah. You're reminding me um, of the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. That's so. exactly how I like to describe. <laughs> like, I'm like, think of Big Fat Greek Wedding. That's, I love, you know, working with people like that. <laughs> right. So just for everyone's reference or for people who've seen it in a reminder. So Tula, I'm obsessed with it. So yeah. So, and um, mm -hmm. I'm throwing a Big Fat Greek baby shower for a loved one soon. So oh my God. <laughs> watching it. Oh my God. I love that. So Tula, Greek, is in love with Ian, an American, like non-Greek Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And yeah, her dad is like, like mm -hmm. this, this guy's dry. He's not Greek. He's not Greek Orthodox. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a, his family's like a piece of toast. <laughs> They're so dry. And, but she does convince him Ian to get baptized yeah. in the Greek Orthodox Church and yeah I honestly I never watched that critically because he he's so agreeable and he's so in love yes. with her that he's willing mm -hmm. um also I think too like like one could argue like their family they're Greek Orthodox but they're not strict Greek Orthodox so I think it depends too on like the yeah. um like the level of like commitment that a family is to a certain religion because anyone can yeah. get baptized yeah um, but yeah I hadn't like watched that critically and thought like wow like you know, <laughs> it's 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 romantic in the movie but also like what yes. a sacrifice and yeah what a huge ask given how um stubborn like her, yeah. her dad really was being, her dad refused to accept him until yes. he was baptized. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, people's lives are not like my big fat Greek wedding. It could, a lot, parts of it can, but there's a lot of times there's not that comedy or, you know, everyone ends up loving each other and accepting each other. Sometimes it doesn't end up that way you know, and sometimes it does cause a lot of strain in the relationship of like, oh, you're asking me to convert or you're asking me to do that. Some people like, you know, Ian and my big fat Greek wedding, he was very accepting and he was like, yeah, let's do it, whatever. And it was like smooth, kind of smooth, right? Um, that's great, right? If it's like, let's just do it. We're fine. We're going to move on with our lives. It's not a big deal. But a lot of the times it's, it's so much more, right? And um it can be uh, very difficult, if not for both people, at least for one of them. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So potentially before, during um, an attempt to date uh, interculturally, how can codependency prevent or be an obstacle to dating outside of one's culture? And what are the short and long-term consequences of that? So you're saying prior to dating? Or like during, like what if, what during. if the codependency, like the like internal conflict is so strong, mm -hmm. right? So I'm guessing one potential uh, obstacle is like the internal conflict and then a short mm -hmm. or long-term consequence is you just break up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, yeah, it, it, it 
it definitely can cause some strain in the relationship, right? Because what I've seen is that if, if, if one person is so co codependent with their parent and wanting to appease them and honor all of their wishes in terms of their own relationship, that partner, the significant other can feel like they're coming second to the relationship, right? Or that they're not as important or that they don't matter, right? And 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 that's not the case. It's the the person trying to navigate both, right? I'm trying to have a good relationship with my partner while also maintaining a good relationship with my parents, right? And it actually does the opposite, right? It's, it's going to upset one or the other, right? You can't make everybody happy, mm -hmm. right? And so I think a lot of that happens of that strain. I think another thing that happens is when you become codependent, you may be okay with it at first, right? You may be like, okay, this is working. There's benefits that are coming out of it. But oftentimes other things, other emotions start to surface, like resentment towards the parents, right? I made all these sacrifices for them. And look, look, look now, right? Look how my life is now or, you know, resentment, um, a lot of sadness of things that they had to give up changes that they had to make. And that can all be just within themselves or directed towards their parents, directed towards their partner, right? Mm -hmm. Feelings of abandonment, right? They had to abandon parts of themselves, right. right? So there may, you know, they may think that I'm actually helping my relationship with my parents by doing what they want. But if there's this underlying resentment, then that's not actually really bettering the relationship. It's actually making it worse. Right? So that's kind of what I see is that the relationships are all kind of in a way impacted when you start to dishonor your own needs, disown your own needs. Right. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, if you've either worked with this or, I don't know, this could just be like a... Um, archetype in the culture but mm -hmm. I'm yeah like a long-term consequence I envision is okay I'm, I'm codependent with my parents or a parent I try to date outside of my culture it crashes and burns mm -hmm. okay now I find someone within my culture and mm -hmm. comply and potentially like try to create or marry into a long-term partnership and I'm unhappy, right? Mm -hmm. Like this wasn't what I actually wanted or needed. Um, mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that long-term consequence? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's another example of like disowning a part of yourself, right? Of like, I'm going to I'm going to marry or date inside my culture or within the religion of my family because I want to make them happy. And then if you do realize, well, I'm unhappy now, right? Who is that benefiting, right? If you're unhappy, that's going that's gonna to show in your relationships. That's going to show up in your interactions with your parents, whether you're conscious of it or not. Mm -hmm. If there's underlying unhappiness, resentment, anger toward your parents because you made these sacrifices and started dating within your culture to make them happy. And then you find that you're not happy. That's going to show up. Right. And yes, a lot of times they may not be aware of it. A lot of times they may be aware of it. Mm -hmm. Right. But there, there is that, that long-term consequence of like, Oh God, all these feelings are starting to surface. Now I feel this way towards my parents. Maybe even, you know, wanting now to create some distance with my parents because I've made so many sacrifices. Now I just, I don't feel connected to them anymore, right? Mm -hmm. I don't feel this closeness because I've had to lose so much to maintain this relationship, mm -hmm. right? So it may actually in the long term create that distance right. versus that closeness that they're actually seeking and wanting. Right. right. It's going to do the opposite, most likely. Yeah. yeah. But in the short term, right, it may just kind of put like, like a nice little bow on everything. And it's like, all right, good. They're happy. I'm happy. You know, let's, or I think I'm I'm happy, right? 
and uh, problems have gone away, right? But in the long term, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is it sustainable to remain codependent with your family while dating someone outside of your culture who they disapprove of? So I think people do it, right? I think yeah. people definitely do it. Okay. So and 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 they may be they may be very unhappy doing it and 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 or may not even be aware, right? But people do it and for a long, for a long time, right? And so, but I don't think I don't think that it will, it can last a long time and for that person to be happy and to feel like they are in a healthy relationship with their parents, mm -hmm. right? Or even their partners, right? So like, like we just talked about short term, it may be a quick fix, but long term, it's all these things are going to start to show up, right? It, you know, a, a big thing that I've noticed too is a lot of times when when women do this, there's a lot of grief that actually comes up mm -hmm. because they are grieving the life that they wanted, right? The wedding that they wanted or, or how they would have told their parent and maybe their parents' reaction, right? If they didn't get an excited reaction, they grieve that loss, right? they grieve parts of themselves that they've given up. Maybe they grieve the life that they envisioned, right? And so a lot of that can show up in their life, right? Like I said, it might fix things right away, but long-term there could be so much of this underlying stuff that will likely affect your relationship with your parents or the partner and yourself, for sure yourself. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if, yeah, if someone is gearing up to combat their codependency and start dating outside of their culture, what should they be prepared for uh, to navigate from the reactions of their family? So... It, it really depends. Every family is different, right? But I think if they go into it with an open mind, meaning they may not be jumping for joy and be super excited, right? They may have, they're allowed to have their own reaction, right? And, and that's in a way, that's okay for them to have their reaction. They're allowed to have their reaction. They're allowed to have their beliefs and their opinions and their ideas of how they want things to play out. They're allowed to do that. No one can force them otherwise. Just like you don't want anyone forcing you to change your beliefs and the way you live your life, right? And so going into it with not expecting it to be terrible, right? Or super wonderful, but kind of exploring like, okay, it could be a variety of responses that we get from them, right? And kind of reminding yourself of why am I doing this? What am I, what are the, my expectations, right? What are my expectations? What am I wanting to get out of this? What am I hoping for, right? Because then you could really dig deep into like, what does this mean to me? And if I don't get it, if I don't get what I'm needing, how can I soothe that part of myself if I don't get it from my family? Mm -hmm. right? If they're not excited, if they're not congratulating me, if they're not hugging me, kissing me, excited, you know, wanting to plan the wedding or whatever, whatever it is, celebrating my new relationship. Okay, what can I do for myself to soothe that part? And who can I turn to, right, after that interaction that will support me? Right. Who are my people? Who are my people that are going to like be my cheerleaders? Mm -hmm. Right. It's not going to replace my parents. No one will. But 
it'll help feel supported, right? And I think support is so crucial, especially when we do feel rejected or disowned by our family. We need that support from others. And it may not be family. Sometimes it is family. You know, um, I was lucky enough that I grew up with my cousins. They were like siblings to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're so similar to me. And when I, you know, I tell them everything. And they're from my dad's side, right? They're from my dad's side. And um, I can tell them everything. And if I didn't get the reaction um, that I wanted from either my dad or, or my parents, they were there to be like, oh, we got you. We support you. We love you no matter what, just the way you are. Right. And that's like what an incredible gift to get that from your family or from anyone. Right. So I think that that's so crucial of like knowing who your people are, who you can turn to. Right. When you are not having that support. Mm -hmm. Right. And even your your partner. Right. Going to your partner and leaning on them for support. Mm -hmm. Right. I think all of those things are really important. And so, yeah, having that that kind of realistic expectation of like, OK, what are the possible outcomes? And if it doesn't turn out the way that I want it. Right. I don't have to force it. I don't have to try with every ounce of my being to try to get them to agree or be okay with it, right? I can, I need to just turn inward and really soothe myself because I just experienced a huge rejection. I just experienced a lot of what I didn't want, right? And so I think we try to soothe that part by saying, please be okay with it, please be okay with it and accept it so I can feel better. We're actually doing the wrong thing. And instead of, okay, turn inward. And how can you soothe that part of yourself, mm -hmm. right? Either with yourself being alone, that might be, okay, I, I need to sit down and meditate or dance or read or write or go out in nature, um, whatever it is, whatever it is that, that helps regulate you, right? It can also look like going to my people. Who are my people mm -hmm. that are going to support me and support my decision? Because it could be really easy for us to get in our heads and say, Oh my God, am I doing something wrong? I didn't get the reaction that I wanted from my parents. Am I doing something wrong? Right? This feels wrong. A lot of times what we when we do something for ourselves and the people don't, other people don't accept it, it could feel like we're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Or that we're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Right? That we're not good enough. And so being able to soothe that in whatever way. Mm -hmm. And that can include therapy. I didn't mention that therapy. Right. right. That would be a good place. Right. A good place to to process that and to work through that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so those are some expectations. But again, not everybody um, will respond that way. Some people may respond in a loving way in an accepting way. And that's great. Right. That's what we want. That's what we hope for. Um, but if not, then having those tools. Having those tools waiting for you so that you're not just like, oh, my God, what do I do now? Having those tools waiting for you, right? Not to erase what you've gone through, not to erase the emotions or make them disappear, but to say, okay, I'm feeling this way. And now I'm prepared, right? I can leave this conversation and I know that I need to be alone or that I need to go to my friend's house or I need to talk to my boyfriend or I need to meditate or go schedule an appointment with my therapist. I know that I need to do this so that I can process and work through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about like the harsher realities of intercultural dating? Like I, I know of couples, like I've had patients who like one partner, like was disowned by their family, you know, because mm -hmm. they date someone outside of the religion. Mm -hmm. Um, or yeah. So like, I'm thinking of like harsher realities, like, yeah, like disownment, um, potentially like, I say it like, like somewhat different. So like, like estrangement, like, mm -hmm. you know, like we'll still celebrate holidays together, but I won't talk to your partner or I'll barely mm -hmm. talk to you. 
um mm. like prejudice like like mm. maybe there is acceptance but there's just passive aggressive comments or mm -hmm. oh read this article or you know this week I was speaking to this religious leader and he was talking mm -hmm. about this this family when they mixed religions and it really didn't work out yeah mm -hmm. so um yeah some type of prejudice or like racism um yeah. yeah your thoughts on like some of the harsher realities of dating our culture and like how yeah like being codependent with your family like if you do start to combat that yeah how to navigate facing those mm -hmm. well yeah I mean those are obviously way tougher situations right and so trying to combat that right I think what will ultimately happen I think it will just cause if they're so set on not accepting that person and you try, you, you're you codependent, right? And you're either trying to convince them, right? Or, or, or lying about whether you guys are still together or not, right? I think ultimately that in itself is going to make things so much worse. It's going to make things so much worse between you guys because you are trying to force something. Right. You're trying whenever you're trying to force something, it's just it's just not going to work. Right. You're trying to force something. And I think it's good to understand why people are trying so badly to force their family to accept. Right. Mm -hmm. Back to that. Right. Of like, why does it matter so much? What does it mean to me that they are being racist or they've disowned me or they no longer talk to me that they you know, only see me during holidays or make passive aggressive comments. What does that mean to me? And a lot of the times that comes down to, you know, the person's self-worth, mm -hmm. right? These beliefs that they have about themselves. I'm not good enough. I'm not loved, right? I'm not accepted, whatever it is. I'm not, I'm different. I'm not part of this family, right? And so, and a lot of this does stem, my belief, this just doesn't happen in adulthood, right? Of like, all of a sudden, this happens and it's like devastating. A lot of this stems from childhood, mm -hmm. right? There may have been other moments where you experienced rejection, right, from your parents. And as an adult, this happens and it's just like opens this wound even more. Right. Right. And so that part of you hasn't been healed. And now it's like this open, exposed wound and you're trying to heal it. But you don't even know how. Right. You're trying to put, like, what do they say, like a bandaid on a bullet hole. Right. Mm -hmm. like, that's 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 not going to work. Right. And so. I think, right, having these conversations, if the family is willing, right, having conversations, having, you know, conversations with them and saying, can we sit down and talk about this, right, and allowing each person to say what they need to say, right, and not trying to force, right, but just sharing your perspective, sharing what you want from them and not demanding anything, not threatening, not you know, giving them ultimatums, right? Even though they may be doing that, right? Mm -hmm. But being able to try to have a conversation, if they're willing, then that's great. But if they're not, I think there needs to be that radical acceptance mm -hmm. that needs to start playing a role of they've said no and they keep saying no. And I need to learn to accept that. That doesn't mean I have to be okay with it. It doesn't mean that I have to be like, happy about it but it's okay this is where they are right and sometimes I even see if the family hasn't disowned them the woman will the adult child will pull away because they are hearing you know racist remarks or passive aggressiveness or the family trying to say well why don't you you know why don't you try to have him convert or change this or change that and the woman decides, I think I need to pull back. Mm -hmm. right? I think I need to create some distance because this is not good for me. 
right? This is not good for my mental health. So I'm needing to, I've talked to them, I've tried, right? And it's, we're hitting a wall. And so knowing when you need to maybe pull away as painful as that may be. Right. Instead of forcing something that is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I know that's a tough decision for a lot of people as well. Yeah. So exactly. maybe the other way around, it may not, yeah, it may not just be the family pulling away. It may end up being the woman, the child, the adult child that pulls away. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely like, like, yeah, worked with patients or again, like no people. And yeah, sometimes like it really is like, oh, I don't talk to my family anymore. Or it's like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. we didn't talk for like the first three years and then we had a grandbaby mm -hmm. or you know or then mm -hmm. then my sister started to reach out and so mm -hmm. I think too like like it can seem and it might be permanent but also yeah I think a lot of these things are temporary maybe like a decade long temporary but then there's like I don't know um, yeah there's yeah and just to yeah, just to share a little bit of my experience, that's my dad did not go to my wedding. Mm. And so after that, there was that separation. That was my choice. There was that separation. And it wasn't a form of like punishment or anything. It was just like, okay, I need this. Like that was traumatic. That was mm. hard. Right. And I, I need this space. And ultimately, right, we were able to to work through that and reconnect, you know, and then I had my daughter, but sometimes, yeah, it's not just the parent's decision to say, Oh, we don't want you in our life or, you know, we need a break or whatever. Sometimes it's the other way around and saying, wow, this is so painful or I can't, I can't go through this back and forth or this dynamic. And for my own sake, I need that separation. And again, it's not because it's like to punish them, but it's because of their own mental well-being of like it like we're hitting a wall. And so like this is my other option of like I need that separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a very I mean, it's very important to point out because I think as children, anytime our parents withdraw, it feels like a punishment and it might be. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, as adults, like there is a way to create you could say like, you know, emotional distance that is just for, for self-preservation. Like, like there's yeah. no, this, there's no, please don't taint this with any type of punishment or yeah. Sometimes, yes. I don't know, during arguments. Yeah. My husband and I will like take a break and it's not like I'm taking a break. Cause you need to oh. think about this. It's like, I need a break. <laughs> yeah. Pause. yeah. Pause. Well, yeah. We'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. So. I tell my clients all the time, I'm like, take, if you guys need to take a break, like from a conversation, like do it. It's better than trying to force something when you guys are both heated or upset or hurt. Like, I think there's this misconception of like separation or taking a break from something, whether it's super short term, like a few minutes to a few hours to something that's longer term, people see it as like something bad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember people telling me when me and my dad were not speaking, they would say, well, you know, you don't know how long your dad's going to be alive. And what if something happens? And it's like this guilt tripping. And you're like, why does it have to be viewed in such a negative way? Right. Because I'm actually doing something for me. And I think that's where you start to break that codependence of like, I'm finally doing something for me and this is what I need to do and it's not a bad thing right. it's actually the most loving thing I can do for myself right. all right last question Nora what happens when women challenge their codependency with family and they do indeed date outside their culture what happens mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, a lot of the times, you know, uh, what happens with the family or what happens with the woman? Both. I mean, I mean, there may be a lot of, um, 
pushing the boundaries with the family, right? Pushing the boundaries. That can look like, um, right, like trying to convince them, like we talked about, right? Um, guilt tripping, negotiating, right? Um, giving them, threatening them, right, to stop contact. There's going to be, I think it all comes down to like this boundary issue, mm -hmm. right? Of like boundaries are going to be crossed or be at least attempted to be crossed, right? In order to get their way, right? Mm -hmm. And so then it's the woman's responsibility to to just to say, am I going to allow that? Right? Am I going to allow my boundaries to be crossed, right? So that I can maintain this codependency? Or am I going to challenge it and say, no, this is, these are what my decisions and this is what I'm doing. And I really hope that you can support me and be there for me on this journey. But if you're not, that's your decision. Mm -hmm. It's easier said than done. But there may be, yeah, like I said, there may be a lot of that, that pushback from the family. Um, I think with the woman, again, I go back to, I think there is this feeling of I did something wrong. This is like my fault. I lost my family. I pushed them away. Right. And then there, there, it starts to really mess with their decision. Right. And it, it and this kind of uh, self doubt. Right. Did I make the right choice? Was it worth it? Right. And so I think that's a lot of what women need to work through is like, that self-doubt because of not having that acceptance from their family, um, the guilt, the feelings of abandonment that their family is not supporting them or no longer in their life, right? Um, so a lot of work's got to be done, mm -hmm. right? Because there are multiple losses that may right. happen with that. But also... I think recognizing and empowering themselves either through by themselves or with the work of therapy of recognizing why did I do this, right? Going back to what was my reason that I did this? Why did I honor my needs? Why did I break this codependency, right? Go back to that because that's going to ground you. That's, that's going to be your anchor, Right. And going back to that, because we could really, really start to doubt ourselves. And so working through that and being able to remind yourself of this, this the decisions, even if, let's say, even if the relationship doesn't work out, that still doesn't mean that they made a mistake. Relationships don't work all the time. Right. And so everybody has a right to decide who they want to date, even if it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. right and so maybe not being so hard on themselves either right so critical of themselves because a lot of what we see is once the family's gone if they've disowned them that criticism may go away from them but now the woman is criticizing herself now she's mirroring what the family was doing she's mirroring it with you know doing it with herself mm -hmm. and so being able to work through that to those challenges mm -hmm. right and practice that self-acceptance that self-love um with dating outside the culture. All right. Well, thank you so much. People want to connect or learn more about you. Where should they go? Yeah, they can go to my website at bermudastherapy.com. My contact info is on there and they can reach out. Okay, I will put a link to that in the show notes, show notes. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you for being here. And dear listener, thank you for listening. Hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week. Take care. Hey girl, it's Marissa again. I'm not like a regular podcaster. I'm a cool podcaster, right? Thank you for listening and staying till the end. You can find me on Instagram at Therapy with Marissa. Email me, Marissa at codependummy.com. Check out codependummy.com for more information on the show. 
and baby girl, a subscribe, rating, and review would be much appreciated. Till next time, I want you to remember, if you are feeling unseen, I see you. If you are feeling unheard, I hear you. And if you think that you don't matter, know that you matter to me. I want you to go out there so you can stop playing small and start taking up space, you dummy. And now, the disclaimer. Girl, this is not therapy and I am not your therapist. This podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regards to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, publisher, or guests are rendering any legal, clinical, or other professional service. If you want or need a professional, please find one.